Welcome moviegoers. Um, my name's Meredith Bergman and I'm a former academic and a former uh, president of the New South Wales Legislative Council. I was also a co-convener of the anti-apartheid movement in the late 60s and 70s and was a, one of the campaigners against the uh, sporting tours that came at that time and of course got arrested on a number of occasions. I've maintained a 50-year uh, connection with South Africa and recently um, was part of the group that took uh, Memories of the Struggle, Australians Against Apartheid, the uh, exhibition about Australia's role in the international struggle. Uh, we took it to South Africa where it was uh, exhibited in um, Johannesburg and Cape Town. Now, I'd like to, I'm talking today to the uh, producer, writer and narrator of the wonderful film, Life is Wonderful, Sir Nick Stadlin. Um, he's a former High Court judge um, of, from the United Kingdom. And uh, he will hopefully explain how a High Court judge came to be making a film about the Ravonia trial in South Africa. Um, Welcome, Nick. Very pleased to be virtually with you, even though several thousand miles away. Yes, congratulations on a wonderful film. It, it often had me in tears. Um, and it, it's obviously a passion project for you. Um, can you give us a quick description of how uh, the film project came about? It does seem a strange thing for a, uh, a, a judge to be doing. Uh, it, it, well, indeed, it is strange, uh, and I've been asking myself this question for the last seven years. Um, it goes back, in a way, to when I, 1968, when I was 17, and I'd been on an English-speaking union scholarship to New York before going to Cambridge University, and I was working as a busboy. I was working as a busboy in the Tavern in the Green in New York uh, on the night that Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis, and I just, as a matter of impulse and instinct, got on a Greyhound bus uh, to Memphis to show solidarity with uh, Martin Luther King and spent a couple of days there at a vigil. And I then hitchhiked to Atlanta where the funeral was and got a lift from a young man. And I, uh, after half an hour, he opened his glove compartment and he picked up a gun and he kept tossing the gun up and down. And he said, this is for any N word loving outside agitator I, came acro I come across. And it seemed to me I ticked almost all of those boxes. And I had chucked in the back of the car, uh, the banner, uh, the piece of uh, cardboard saying Atlanta where I was hitchhiking to. And on the back of it, it said, honor Martin Luther King now. And I spent the next four and a half hours wondering uh, which way up I'd left the banner in the back of the car. And it just gave me an introduction to the, the, the real brutality and cruelty and, and irrationality of racial discrimination and hatred but coupled with, with violence. And that left a deep impression on me. In 2013, I had taken early retirement as a High Court judge. And I was in Cape Town uh, with a view to reviving a series of one hour political interviews I'd done by broadcast, by podcast for The Guardian. Uh, and I had interviewed Tabo, uh, I had interviewed uh, Desmond Tutu and F.W. de Klerk. But it just was overtaken by the death, quite coincidentally, of Nelson Mandela. And in that week, there was wall-to-wall -wall coverage on the press and in the media uh, of the early days of the struggle, and in particular, the Ravonia trial. And I was intrigued. And I tracked down Dennis Goldberg through an interview he'd given at the Cape Times, uh, who was then one of the surviving co-defendants of Mandela, and rang him up and said, you don't know me. Uh, I'm a retired English High Court judge. Can I come and talk to you about the Ravonia trial? And I think Dennis was more intrigued by me than I was by him. And so said, come and uh, spend the day with me in Hart Bay. Uh, and I discovered through Dennis that there were then surviving three co-defendants of Nelson Mandela, Andrew Mullingeni, black, uh, Kathy Kathrada, Indian, Dennis, white, and three members of the legal defense team, Joel Joffe, the attorney, or solicitor as we call it in England, uh, George Bezos, one of the, jun one of the junior barristers, advocates, uh, and um, Dennis Cooney. And I was amazed 
when I discovered these stories of incredible courage and self-sacrifice uh, and integrity, uh, at that I'd never heard of their names, let alone what they had done. And when I got back to England, I discovered, talking to colleagues in journalism, in law and politics, that very few people had heard them. All the concentration had been on this one figure, Nelson Mandela, who was indeed a, a once in a lifetime, once in a generation uh, figure of international stature because of his charisma. But it seemed to me that if this was just at the beginning of the corruption, the years of corruption and state capture in South Africa, and there was growing disillusionment, particularly among young blacks in the townships, with the slow pace of economic transformation, the slow um, uh, pace of ending racial discrimination. Uh, and none of these, as far as I could see, very few young people had heard or knew anything about these stories. And I thought if I was a young black person or indeed white person in South Africa, I would want to know that my political freedoms had been won at a great cost uh, in terms of the liberty, the loss of life, of this small group of people who had brought to an end, admittedly after um, two or three decades had passed, but had brought to an end a system of apartheid, which nobody thought at that time could be brought to an end without a violent civil war. And I thought if I was a young person, I would, I would be inspired to ask myself, if these ordinary people who I can identify with, Dennis Goldberg was an engineer, Andrew Mullingeni was a golf fanatic, if these ordinary people could change the world, bring about an end to apartheid, what can I do in the 21st century to change the world and improve the lot of my fellow countrymen and countrywomen? Well, the, the main character in the film, of course, um, is Dennis uh, Goldberg, and you can't help falling in love with him. I, I just thought, oh, I want this guy to be my uncle or my grandfather. He was just wonderful. And you've written that uh, Dennis had a natural joie de vivre and intellectual curiosity. Um, were you immediately attracted to the idea of, of centering the film around him or did that just grow out of the project? No, it grew out of the project and it grew really out of the different character of Dennis, Kathy and Andrew. Um, there was, and I think it emerges in the film, a, a real bond of camaraderie and respect and love between these three, and indeed between them and their lawyers. Uh, but it just happened that Andrew, although he had a very sardonic sense of humor, I mean, there's a bit in the film where he calls uh, Dennis a cheeky bastard for um, being rude to the head of the prison service, uh, into whose um, tender hands he was going to be spending the rest of his life, so he thought. Um, he was very shy and retiring and, and modest, whereas Dennis is one of the most, was one of the most garrulous uh, talkers I've ever met. And so he just burst onto the scene. You couldn't contain him. Um, and uh, he, he, that's just Dennis, who Dennis is and who Dennis was. But he actually um, was one of the first, the two supporters of the film, when I set about this crazy idea of making a film, uh, were Dennis and Joel Joffe. And Dennis was particularly keen on it because he thought that it was important that people knew not only around the world, but particularly in South Africa, people knew that it wasn't just this great charismatic figure who ended apartheid on his own. It was ordinary people like him and Kent and Kathy and Andrew and, and the others, um, because that provided a link of inspiration uh, between those brave people and young people today who were and they are a bit very disillusioned. The, um... I've actually been privileged to meet both um, Nelson Mandela and Ahmed Kathrada. Um, but after watching the film, you realise that there was this whole host of amazing personalities and individuals of such integrity. Um, and there's really enough material for another 10 films. You, you've got to do the the rest of the uh, Ravonia uh, and the lawyers. I mean, the lawyers' um, stories were so interesting and they had to give up so much too. Um, so I think there's another 10 films there and are you up for it? Well, uh, if that's an offer to commission, thank you very much, I accept the <laughs> offer. Um, but uh, the, seen it. <laughs> the sad truth is that um, I think the film, um, what makes the film 
have such impact as it has is that as well as the archive, there, the, the testimony is, of, of these events is told through the voices of the protagonists. And it just happened that when I rolled up, uh, there were just these three lawyers and three defendants, co-defendants still alive. And uh, I think that to do a film about the, uh, uh, about the others without that ingredient would be, I think, very difficult. I am hoping and planning to make a different film, uh, which is about Steve Biko and the Black Consciousness Movement, which was really the next stage in the struggle against apartheid. The people in the 1970s who picked up the baton from the Rivonia trialists who were all then either in exile or in prison. Um, and there are, because they're all 15 years younger, many of the protagonists, the people who are closest to Steve Biko are still alive, and I've uh, met them and uh, they're happy to take part. So there really is a, a possibility that of a film about uh, black consciousness and, and Steve Biko coming out yes. of the, uh, your film stable. Well, it, it was, uh, the, 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 it's been put on hold because of the pandemic. I, was, I spent three weeks in South Africa in January of last year, setting it, uh, beginning to set it all up and lining up a lot of very interesting people who worked very closely and were collaborators and comrades of Steve Biko. Uh, but we're just gonna have to wait until uh, it's possible to get that project off the ground. As to the, um, the other defendants and lawyers, I have got uh, tens of hours of unused footage that couldn't be fitted into the film. And we are, we, Joel Joffe and I and John Bassby set up a, uh, uh, and Ben Valentin QC, we set up a charity in England called Life is Wonderful. And uh, with a view to setting up a website which will house the unused footage. Uh, and from that unused footage, we will make uh, educational materials available for schools in, in, in English speaking uh, countries around the world so that people can see more of uh, the stories um, that uh, lie behind this uh, extraordinary event. Um, you, you and I have had a little bit of um, emailing backwards and forwards where we've actually uh, talked about the, the worry that the uh, new generation of um, South African school children, the, the born free generation, uh, really, I, I, I realised when I was there with the exhibition that they knew nothing about the international campaigns. And, and I thought that was probably to do with the fact that the ANC was wanting to emphasise that the um, struggle, that, that it was won, that the freedom was won through the um, struggle inside South Africa. And I saw that as an important uh, position for them to be taking. And so the fact that they knew nothing, nothing about the international, they didn't even know about the campaigns against the Springboks and fairly dramatic events like that. But then I started realising that they knew nothing about apartheid, that in actual fact, they probably knew it existed, but had no, um, knowledge and and the, your idea of this film being taken out to the um the secondary schools around uh south africa is a terrific idea and very important how's that going do we know well it's going very well the the, the ministry of basic education in south africa in pretoria <clears throat> has agreed to show the film at all 6500 high schools secondary schools uh as part of their new history curriculum and to promote non-racialism and uh, I think that is, uh, and so we are raising money to enable that to happen because uh, it's an expensive exercise. A lot of schools don't have facilities, electricity, broadband, and so on. It's crucial because everywhere I took the film in South Africa, and I've taken it uh, 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 across the country, uh, the, the questions that would always be asked by uh, parents and teachers in the Q&As was, when can our children see this film? Because they are not taught this history at school. And given the degree of disillusionment on the one hand with the slow pace of change, but also given that unscrupulous politicians have used, play, are playing the race card and have played the race card for their own purposes. It's really important that young people in South Africa should know and understand and take pride in the fact that the people who actually brought apartheid to an end were people of the utmost integrity and people for whom uh, non-racialism was an absolutely essential part of their political program. 
I filmed Andrew Mullingeni getting an honorary doctorate at the University of South Africa. And he summed it up perfectly when he said, we were a multiracial band of comrades fighting for a non-racial society. And that message is so important in the contemporary South Africa. And a million young people seeing this film and getting this message and having it um, relate, ha having their teachers relate those messages to them and what, what it means today in their lives. What can they do to change and improve uh, the, the lot of their fellow countrymen and countrymen? I think that has a huge potential. And Cyril Ramaphosa is fighting a, 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 a noble battle to try and steer South Africa back to those values, the Nelson Mandela Rivonia trial values of integrity, courage, self-sacrifice, commitment to other people. But he needs help from the bottom up. Um, and so that's why we're raising money uh, around the world to uh, enable, to support the Ministry of, of Education in making this film available to all young people in the country. It's because I've always said that it, um, South Africa is probably the only country in the world where other people in the, internationally, we know about their struggle so well. I mean, Australians knew about Sisulu and Tambo and Mandela. They were names that were very uh, familiar to us. And they were such people of such incredible integrity and, uh, and talent. I mean, the, it was a very, very talented leadership. And yet, um, as I say, the, the young South Africans today seem almost unaware of, of, of their pantheon of heroes. Um, I just want to finish now quickly. Um, were there ever um, times when you were questioning the, the three that had spent that, you know, over 20 years in jail, where you just felt you had to back off because it was getting too much, that you were trying to dig up memories that they really didn't want to go into? Uh, there was there's one time in the film where Dennis is talking about uh, his own torture uh, when he after he was arrested and had, he escaped and then uh, was caught again and um, and he said I don't want to talk about it uh, it's sufficient to say that I was I didn't give anybody away uh, but he told me in part of the unused footage that 30 years later he was at some seminar in Germany and a psychologist was going through the indicia of torture and the effect of torture on your psyche and he just burst he had a complete nervous breakdown and collapsed because he realized that every one of those things applied to him and it has had lasting lasting scars i interviewed uh, albie Sachs, the former uh, constitutional court uh, uh, judge uh, in south africa who had been twice subjected to long periods of um, uh, solitary confinement uh, and he said that the effect of that is with him today. He's in his 80s. Um, and he said that he could never, when he, he married immediately after he came out, somebody who had also been in solitary confinement. And he said he could never have married at that time somebody who had not had that experience because it is so devastating. I guess. And I... One, of the, one of the things that um, I just kept in, in the film, one line at the end of the, towards the end of the film, where Andrew Mullingeni turns to Dennis Goldberg and says, when you look at the things that are going on in the country today, Dennis or Nick, uh, it makes my heart to bleed. My heart bleeds, Dennis. And that is what they all felt, all three of them. Um, they were loyal. The, the ANC, uh, part of its success was built on di party discipline. And so they, until about a year before the end, uh, they uh, uh, of, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the state capture years, all their, um, their uh, submissions and representations were made behind the scenes within the party. But eventually they all spoke out and demanded that there be resignations and a change of government and a change of party leadership. Um, but they did feel very bitterly, and Dennis felt very strongly, that um, this is not just a question of white uh, oppression of black people. It's a question of civil liberties and human rights and they apply and are just as important under the current dispensation as they were under apartheid, which is not to say that the things that are, going, that are going wrong in South Africa today are anywhere as bad as apartheid, plainly they're not. But it is to say that 
the values that though that the people who brought apartheid to an end believed in are as important today as they were then and i believe that president ramaphosa appreciates that and as dennis died and andrew died and george bezos the uh, junior defense counsel died he made a point of publicly embracing them and elevating them to the status of national heroes and role models um, because I think he appreciates that the, the change that needs to be brought about to bring an end to those days of corruption and cronyism uh, is hugely assisted by engaging the new generation in the values of integrity, self-sacrifice, altruism, commitment to a cause that those people represented. Well, thank you very much, Nick, and uh, uh, that's a good uh, place to uh, finish. We, do, we have run out of time. Um, but all I can say is I really look forward to seeing your film about Steve Biko. And I just want to thank you again for making this wonderful film, which will continue to have an effect on people's lives in the future. So thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity and very nice to have uh, engaged in the questions and answer with you.